They are a straightforward celebration of blue and space, of formless form. The most abstract of our surroundings, the cloudy sky. The body paintings are more complex, the below element of the formula. As spacious as above, the body's many functions and parts are invisible to the physical eye, but well known by the mind's eye. I have always chosen abstraction over realism. I have always looked inward and attempted to record that which is known but not seen, to map internal space. I spend much time at work allowing the body to feel out the color and form, working until the structure appears on the canvas, forms itself, and interacts with the back of things and the front of things. I continue until it resolves and a rightness is felt. To do this, I place the body above the mind, shift the hierarchy and move the mind down the line a few notches. The mind becomes a limb of the body, not the pinnacle. I allow the body to make and do, to organize and restructure. This is acknowledging that the body is where the unconscious, that which is connected to everything, resides. This is unmodern knowing, innate, native. My experience is that the body communicates clearly when given the time and the mediums to work with. I make the work first and discover later its reason. I called all the body paintings internal, a made up word I thought must exist until I looked for it. I can partially unscientifically justify the word as internal, which is intrinsic, added to the neuter of um, which is neither one thing nor another. For I'm not working with gender, I'm working with the body of land, body of water, body of human. Boyle uses three descriptions repeatedly throughout the book. Diaphanous bodies, shining bodies, and colored bodies. Diaphanous. I work in layers, transparent and opaque, repeated forms, half-recognized entities, overlap each other to become diaphanous bodies. Shining bodies. When I first began visiting Mayo on residency at the Ballon Glen Arts Foundation, I discovered that everything shone. Sparkly rock on the beach, the surface of the water, uh, the glisten in a calf's eye. My reaction to the life and everything was to begin using metallic and iridescent paint. As tacky as it seemed at the time, I began experimenting with metallic pigments and interference paint. Upon reading about Boyle's considerations on Muscovy glass, I realized that the component of the iridescent silver, gold, and bronze paint I use is itself that substance he called Muscovite. I use and have always used acrylic paint, which these days is convenient and stable. It's not generally preferred by artists, as Boyle is much more luscious, watery, and the color deep but I have found a way to work with acrylic that counteracts its plastic nature and to make it work in my favor. My favorite brand of paint, Golden Paint, is made by enthusiastic New Yorkers who always answer the phone when I have questions. They produce a paint called Interference. It comes in blue, red, orange, green, gold, and one which is both green and orange. Interference is a, pro is a process that we've all seen in one instance or another, but may not have had a name for it. It occurs in the soap bubbles in the sink on a crow's wing, and it appears uh, when, it, when a crow's wing appears black and then blue. In birds, it's called structural coloration, and was first observed by Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton. When I was, this is Robert Boyle again, when I was considering the opinions of the chemists about colors, I took then a feather of a convenient bigness and shape, and holding it at a fit distance betwixt my eye and the sun, when he was near the horizon, we thought there appeared to be, to be a variety of little rainbows, with differing and very vivid colors, of which none was constantly to be seen in the feather. The like phenomena I have other times, though not with altogether so good success, produced by inter posing at, at a due distance a piece of black ribbon betwixt the most, excuse me, betwixt the almost setting sun and my eye, not to mention the trials I've made to the same purpose with other bodies. So you can imagine Boyle's 
studio, or I imagine Boyle's studio. He had all these things, bits and pieces hanging around, feathers and um, glass vials and prisms and curtains and um, pieces of glass painted different colors, you know, he, that he would hold up to. I'm talking about him. <laughs> Does that mean he disagrees? <laughs> So anyway, I'm, I, you know, there's, there's all these materials that he uses, which actually are very like an artist's studio. I am, at, you know, I have feathers and skulls and things I pick up and rocks and you know stuff that I like to look at and pieces of paper that are painted one color on the front and another color on the back and, you know, um, anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, so this painting here uh, is that one there on the end and you'll see that it looks different here than it does there in the end. I have a few versions of it here. So this, I'll explain now about the interference paint. To make interference paint, uh, tiny transparent mica flakes are coated on all sides with a thin layer of metal oxide, either iron oxide or titanium dioxide. These metal oxides are highly refractive, which means they can bend light, and reflective. The metal oxide layer reflects light twice from the outer surface and from the boundary with the mica flake. This double reflection happens again on the other side of the flake. The delay between the first and second reflection slightly phase shifts the wavelengths of light. I see somebody nodding. <laughs> so, um, the shift cancels out some wavelengths of light and reinforces others. These reinforced wavelengths are those of the dominant color of iridescence. And so um, the blue up there, this blue is interference paint. So it's especially beautiful when on black. Um, the, down the bottom, this is gold interference here, down there. Um, and when you look at the painting, and this painting has the sunlight shining upon it. No, it's actually reflected off the wall. It was coming in from the skylight and reflected off a wall and bouncing up to shine on the painting. Um, and you see there that bottom corner now looks very different from, with a different light. Um, um, so, but what does this have to do with body paintings? Why should I do this? Uh, the effect created by the iridescent and interference paint means that the work has a few faces. That which you can see when looking directly straight on at the painting, and that which you can see when the light or angle of sight changes. I'd always wished to make work that changed as the day changed, which altered itself as time progressed. We measure time with the light of day or night. The quality and color of light changes with the seasons. This work cannot be seen as a whole in one, in one place, in one piece, in a moment. It requires time. This is Robert Boyle again. Froth. I take this occasion to observe to you that if water be agitated into froth, it exhibits, you know, a white color which soon after it loses upon the resolution of the bubbles into air and water. Now in this case, either the whiteness of the froth is a true color or not. If it be, then true colors, supposing the water pure and free from mixtures of anything tenacious, may be as short-lived as those of the rainbow. Also the matter, wherein the whiteness did reside, may in a few moments perfectly lose all footsteps or remains of it. Just love, you know, that he uses the word footsteps. That description, just his languages. And besides, even diaphanous bodies may be capable of exhibiting true colors by reflection, for that whiteness is so produced we shall anon make it probable. But if on the other side it be said that the whiteness of froth is an emphatical color, then it must no longer be said that fantastical colors require a certain position of the luminary and the eye, and must and must be varied or destroyed by the change thereof. Since froth appears white, whether the sun be rising or setting, or in the meridian, or anywhere between it and the horizon, and from what neighboring place soever the beholder's eye looks upon it. But if the whiteness of water turned into froth must therefore be reputed 
emphatical because it appears not that the nature of the body is altered, but only that the disposition of its parts in reference to the incident light has changed. Why not? Why may not the whiteness be accounted emphatical too? And yet this so easily acquired whiteness seems to be as truly its color as the blackness was before, and, it, and at least is more permanent than the greenness of leaves, the redness of roses, and in short, than the genuine colors of the most parts of nature's productions. It may indeed be further objected that according as the sun or other luminous bodies changes place, these emphatical colors alter or vanish. But not to repeat what I have just now said, I should add that if a piece of cloth in a draper's shop, in such the light being seldom primary, be very easily folded, it will appear of differing colors as the parts happen to be more illuminated or more shaded. And if you stretch it flat, it will commonly exhibit some one uniform color. And yet these are not wont to be reputed in emphatical, so that the difference seems to be chiefly this, that in the case of the rainbow and the light, the position of the luminary varies the color, and in the cloth I have been mentioning, the position of the object does it. <coughs> I don't know if any of that was interesting to you, but this is the world I've been living in. And when I would come to my studio in the morning to make work, I would open the book and pick a page. Cordula says that I read it all and I didn't, because it's just, I get fascinated by that paragraph, you know, by that, by this idea of froth and, um, I just I'd stay there for a while, you know, and then um, and then move on another day. Um, my reaction to my reaction to and use of colors has always been visceral. In my early life and into my thirties, my work was highly saturated and varied. During my apprenticeship and in mature phase, I made abstract paintings with an em emphasis on space that reflected the landscape. This work relied on saturated and mixed color from across the spectrum, and had little or no conceptual content. In 2006, as my life was taking a different shape and moving into its middle phase, green became abhorrent and yellow intolerable. These are some of the paintings from that phase. I was living in New York and observing, absorbing all the solid, soaring structures around me and reading my way through the theories of everything on the subway ride to my studio. I had reduced my palette to four colors, mixing ultramarine blue and raw umber with white to make anything from cool and warm darks to pale silvery grays. My fourth color was a particular orange which was laid down underneath the then predominantly somber blue, brown, and gray paintings. So that's the orange. Um, the uh, circle in the middle which looks black is actually the mixture of uh, Raw umber and ultramarine, um, and then and then the greys are the same thing, but with white added. So it's all about proportion at a certain stage. And um, I found to my delight that the limited palette led to a sense of freedom. I explored every mixture of these four colours and their combinations occasionally testing the water with the introduction of another only to find myself eliminating it again. So this is probably one of my favorite paintings from that, from that period of time and there is, there is no red in it. Um, but I loved that silvery uh, gray that came out of the ultramarine and longer. Minor change came when I began visiting an event